All right, so today in lecture, we're going to go over Ajax and polling. I want to say right up front that these are not topics that you have to do in your homework. So I, I want to cover them. These are important topics for you to know, but they are more front end related topics. The server doesn't care if it's getting an Ajax uh, uh, or polling request. It doesn't care. Uh, the HTTP parsing, the requests, the responses, it's all the same on the server. Uh, so it's not a topic I'm going to focus on too much in this class. We'll get the same effect when we talk about WebSockets. We'll get the same features that we're going to talk about today. But I, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't talk about Ajax and polling at all. And we will use a little bit of Ajax. But again, since it's front-end stuff, uh, we, uh, we're not going to talk about it too much. In the sense that I'm not going to force you to do Ajax in your homework assignment. In your group project, you have a decision. Do you want to use some Ajax? Do you want to sprinkle it in? I do force you to use WebSockets anyway, so you can do everything over WebSockets. But if you want to sprinkle in some Ajax, sometimes it makes sense to do that. Uh, I want to make sure I say this right at the top, because if anybody comes to office hours, or if anybody's watching this after the, the fact, because in office hours I sent you to this video, and you're using the things that I talk about today in your homework, I'm going to know that you didn't watch lecture. And if you're watching this right now because I sent you there, like, you know what you did. Like, you, you, uh, and this is something that I see quite a bit. Students come into office hours and asking me questions that I've, I have entire lectures about. Uh, and then it becomes obvious that they haven't even attempted to watch the lecture. So if that's you, come on, man, what are you doing? Uh, for everybody else, let's enjoy some topics and talk about uh, some concepts that you're almost certainly going to see out there in your careers. So let's talk about Ajax and polling. And I got to stop that server because all the logs are driving me nuts. Let's talk about this. So we have a problem with the way our sites are structured right now in that every time a user sends data to our server, it forces a page reload. That's the way our HTML forms work is you click submit that creates a get or post request to the server. And then the server responds with an HTTP response. And whatever that response contains, that's what's rendered on the page. It's similar to a, uh, to a 200 response or a 404 or any other request. Uh, it's the same as like clicking a link or typing in a URL. You are creating a brand new page load. You're requesting a brand new page when you submit a form. This isn't what we want. This isn't how you experience the internet. So obviously, there's some technology that th these sites are using, the ones that you use, uh, in that they're allowing you to interact with it without having to refresh the page constantly. So how do we do that? Of course, the answer is going to be Ajax today anyway. It's a new water bottle. I don't know how to drink out of it yet. <laughs> as ridiculous as that sounds. So our goal um, that we want to achieve is to build a chat app for those of you who were watching just before lecture, watching on Twitch, uh, that's what I was messing with on that server. That's just a, a very simple chat app. You can post messages. It's one global chat. Everybody can post and see what each other's posting. Uh, so this is our goal. We want users to be able to send messages and every user to be able to see those messages. Basically, uh, an MVP, uh, a minimal viable product of or a proof of concept, if you will, um, that we can have user communication. And then, of course, like for your group project, those that communication will be more involved than just a chat, just chat. So, uh, uh, but that's what we'll build in lecture is a chat app. We'll see this with Ajax and polling, and we'll see this with WebSockets later on in the course. Uh, but that's what I'll use for my lecture examples is simple chat app, proof of concept, show you the technology, and then you can communicate different types of data using those technologies. Uh, so this chat app, we want to use to send messages and everybody can see those messages. What we'll need for this is a way for users to send messages. So a, a form would be the, uh, the first way that we'll think, the way that we know. A form for people to be able to send messages to the chat, to the server, and a way for users to get the chat history and the new messages without refreshing the page. That's our ultimate goal here, is to get them to do this without refreshing the page and certainly without the users taking action. So if the user had to go, you know, press F5 or hit the refresh button every single time to make sh to check if somebody said something in the chat, well, nobody's going to use that chat app. 
because you're going to miss messages. You're going to people aren't going to see your messages for quite a while. So Ajax to the rescue here. So what is Ajax? This stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Not really used for XML anymore, but the acronym stuck. But Asynchronous JavaScript. So this is JavaScript that's going to run asynchronously or independent of the rest of the code and independent of that page load. So this is going to be JavaScript that makes HTTP requests after the page loads. That's the, the core of what Ajax is, making HTTP requests and receiving and handling the responses after the page loads. Usually we have to create a new page load to be able to get an HTTP request. And then that page load will have you know embedded content, the images, CSS, JavaScript, the browser will make more requests for those that content. But after the page is fully loaded and rendered, sometimes we want to make more HTTP requests without requiring a page load. That's what Ajax is going to get us. So I'm going to throw you right in the code. Uh, this is the standard format of an Ajax request without using jQuery. Some of you might uh, prefer jQuery in that syntax. Uh, I'm going to use vanilla JavaScript. And this is the format of an Ajax request. We're going to create this XML HTTP request. You can read this as Ajax request. The name has historic reasons. Um, back when XML was very popular. Um, but this is going to create an Ajax request for us. That gives us the request object, a new XML HTTP request object. And then we populate it with the functionality that we want and call the methods that we want on this object to be able to make the Ajax request. Uh, I'm, I'll talk about this one on the next slide, this on ready state change. But to add the type of the request, we're going to use open, specify the HTTP request type, get in this case, and the path slash whatever, whatever you want for the path to be. Request.open, specify the method and the path for this HTTP request. And then request.send is going to ship this off and send this request to the server. So these are the first core pieces, creating the request, setting the method and path, and then sending that request to the server. We also have to set this on ready state change. So this, again, JavaScript is all about event-based architectures. Uh, so this is, again, event-based, and whenever the state, the ready state, technically, whenever the ready state of this request changes, this function is going to be called. The ready state tells us about the state of the request. It can either be uh, not sent, sending, I forget what they all are, sending, you know, different states that, um, that we can be waiting on, uh, errored. Ready state four is the one that we're really concerned about. When the state changes to ready state four, that means that we have the response fully received. We have the entire response from the server and it's ready to be processed. The other ready states, you can handle them. You can do different things with those if you want, um, but you don't have the entire response yet. So, you know, uh, they're usually, you know, unless you're building really advanced features, stuff that, I don't know. But ready state four, that's the juicy one. That means the server has responded. We've went to the TCP socket. We read the content length. We read everything from the body. Everything's here and ready for you. And it's going to be in an object called this.response. That's going to be the body of the response sent from the server. Uh, we also want to check the status. This.status, this is the status code of the HTTP response. So in this case, I'm saying once I get the entire response, if that response is a 200 and everything went fine, then I'm going to do my parsing and parse this stuff. So if I get a 404 response, I don't want to run my parser because I'm not going to have the data that I wanted. I'm not going to have the data I expected if I got a 404 in that case. Uh, and I'm not doing anything. This is where we would actually do stuff with our response. I'm just printing it to the screen because whatever. It's just a lecture example. Uh, and I don't want too much code because it's not going to fit on a slide. But this is where you would actually do something with that response. Oh, I'm blocking it a little bit. 
But ready state four, we usually want to check for the 200 status code, and then we do what we want to do. We can also make post requests. So with a post request, of course, we specify post here. All of this stuff is the same. And when we send, we're going to give the send method a parameter or an argument. This argument is going to be the body of the request that we're sending. So the body of the post request. So I want to send a post request to some path. I'm going to give it some data. And here I'm giving this data as a string. I'm going to format it as a JSON string and send some JSON data to the server. JSON, if, if you're not familiar with JSON yet, it's time to get familiar with it. If you're doing anything on the web, you're almost certainly going to touch a lot of JavaScript. Or, sorry, a lot of JSON. Can you show what's printed by this.response? It depends what the server is sending. So if this is, for example, if I did a get request to slash hello in your homework one, this.response is going to be your hello message. It's going to be the body of the response that the server sent. So it's going to depend on the functionality of the server and of the web app that you're building. Uh, but it's whatever the body of the resp HTTP response is that the server served at this path. That's what this dot response is going to be. Uh, so it depends on what path, you know, what the server, what your server is coded to do at that path, what it's going to respond with. But what would you do with that response? Uh, a lot of the times, to, well, in my uses at least, is uh, take the data of that response and add it to the DOM, add it to the HTML to display it to the user. Usually you're requesting more data. And in the chat app, that's what we're going to do. We're going to request the chat history, get all the chat history, and then add that to a div that's on our page, add it to a div, and display it to the user, display the chat history to the user. So that's what we're leading to. Path will be chat history. We're going to get the chat history and then display it on the page to the user. That's our, our overall goal that we're trying to get with this chat app. Yeah, you put a different function on the console.log line. Yeah, this is where you would do whatever you want. You wouldn't, I mean, unless you're debugging, you're probably not going to print it to the console at all. Uh, even then, uh, this one doesn't make much sense because you'll just go into the browser console, go to the network tab, and check what the response was. You don't need to be printing to the screen these days. Um, but you wouldn't print to the console in this case. Uh, but you do want to do whatever you whatever you want that data. If you're making an AJAX request, presumably you're doing that because you want some information from the server. And this is where you would do whatever you want to do with that information. Okay, I got this information. Why did I want this? That's where your code does right here. Post requests, like I said, same thing, but we specify the body. Whatever's in the send method, that's going to be the body of the post request. And the browser's going to handle all your content length, content type, all that stuff for you. Oh, that's going to be just fine. Yeah, you put whatever, It's this is whatever JavaScript you can dream up. I'm just showing you that this dot response contains the body of the response. And then it's whatever you dream up with that, whatever you're designing for your app, you would start with this dot response. That's what you got from the server. And then do whatever you want to do with it. This dot response will probably be JSON, parse the JSON, extract the juicy bits from it. Excuse me, display that to the user. Maybe that triggers more uh, Ajax requests, you know, whatever your app is doing. And I'll show you the example with the, um, with the chat app. All right, so we can make re requests without loading the page, but why do we really want to do this? Which you're hitting me with chat, so I like it. I, I like that you're leading into to this discussion and thinking about what I'm saying instead of just saying, oh yeah, Ajax, that sounds cool. Why do we want to do this? Why? So there are a few things that this enables. One, and you see this like literally everywhere on the internet now. I shouldn't say literally, it's not. Not literally, literally, but any major website is going to follow this kind of page load method, which is going to get us faster page loads. First, you request the HTML. It's going to have all the structure. It's going to make additional requests for CSS and the JavaScript. And the page loads very quickly. You have the network delay, of course, but as soon as you get the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript, 
that page loads right there very very quickly after the page loads you're going to have ajax requests that request the content of that page the actual data the actual stuff that you're there to uh, that you're there to consume the content that you want that's going to be requested using ajax requests so after the page loads then the ajax requests fire off to actually get the data and this these requests instead of just serving static content here's your html here's your css that's very quick to respond with the the server just reads those files and sends them over the tcp socket and they probably have those files cached already so they just pick, pull them from cache and just ship them right away very very quick the ajax content is going to take a lot longer thinking uh, i'm thinking like a social media site any site where you you have content that's custom to you that's going to take a lot longer to process it's not just taking something from cache and shipping it because then every user has to have their own cache that's just not feasible uh, this usually requires algorithms complex algorithms that are going to look at your activity look at your uh, friends list likes follows whatever it is for the site you're visiting uh, figure out what to recommend to you this is going to take database lookups to be able to um, to be able to get that information so we're going to have to go to disk which is going to be slow a lot of slow complex operations here uh, the server has to do a lot of calculations think of even just twitch uh, i shouldn't say just twitch but even twitch or youtube whether you're watching this on twitch or youtube when you went to this page twitch or youtube will generate a recommended list for you hey i think you should watch these channels hey i think you should watch these videos that takes a lot to generate they have to look at the your viewing history have to look at your likes your actions whatever their algorithms whatever their ai or rather machine learning is doing whatever those algorithms are doing to figure out what to recommend to you that you are most likely to click on uh go into the database to get all of your history a lot going on regardless if you're waiting that long for your entire page to load you might not go to that page you might navigate to some other part of the internet but if the HTML and CSS loads and you look at the skeleton of the website for, you know, and we're still talking just fractions of a second. If you're looking at a skeleton of a website for half a second, it at least gives you something to look at. By the time you look around the page and see what's going on, your Ajax requests are going to come back. All those database lookups will resolve and you're going to get your content. And then later on, after the page loads for a while, it might take a little bit longer to get the ads to load. Ads are uh, uh, needlessly complex. I mean, maybe needed according to the ad agencies, but ads will usually take even longer than the content, uh, just the way they're set up. You have to talk to multiple, there are multiple different uh, stakeholders in there that have to communicate with each other. There's a lot that goes on. It's part of why Google uh, really took over the ad market because they centralized that and did everything in-house. And then anyway, um ads not served through google take forever to load uh and then uh so you quickly see the page the page loads and then your content loads and you can see this go to just about any major website these days and you'll see that behavior the page will load and then the content will load after it might be just a fraction of a second but it's enough to improve the user experience what did google do to ads they just they just kind of Google kind of just controls everything. So it's easier to have faster ad loads. When like Google, when somebody requests something, Google doesn't go send an HTTP request to an ad agency and figure out what they need and stuff. The ad agencies come to them, purchase ads, say, here's my ads. And then Google says, okay, we got it from here. And then Google controls all that stuff. Uh, before Google, the ad, uh, it was just a very complex like way too many parties involved a lot of data being shared after the user requests something uh, but google just does it all in-house and makes it a lot more efficient to the ads load a lot faster they're also everywhere google has their hand in everything it's kind of scary actually but um they're watching you on most websites any website that has google analytics like that's what like google's watching you so they can figure out what ads to show you on a different website uh, they're just things that only Google can do. 
do guns take over? Yeah, well, if they haven't already. I mean, Google's pretty powerful. It's not, not to, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's, don't don't listen, Google. I love you, Google. Don't kill me. Don't erase me. Uh, but but Google has like the, what they've done. I mean, they they can get those faster page loads for what it's worth. Uh, all that effort just to get your ads to load faster. It was it worth it? I don't know. Anyway, uh, so this improves the user experience. Uh, one, we get those faster page loads, but we also don't have page refreshes. The page doesn't reload every time you have an HTTP request. Yeah, they could be, I'm sure they're listening right now. Um, I mean, oh, I'm not on Twitch, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's Google cookies when you visit Twitch, if I'm not mistaken. There's certainly Amazon cookies because uh, Amazon owns Twitch, but if... I, I might be mistaken on that if Google has some third-party cookies on Twitch. Uh, but we also get a better user experience since the page doesn't have to reload every time we send an HTTP request. So every time we get new data or send data to the server, we don't require a page load. So that's going to give us a better user experience as well. Uh, for one, that saves some bandwidth. If we're constantly requesting the entire page, as, assuming it's not cached, that can get really expensive having to get all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and the content every single time we want to do anything. If I want to like like a comment that somebody posted, and to like that comment, I have to go through a full page reload. It's going to increase my bandwidth. It could start flickering the page, especially with the Ajax calls after the page loads. My content's going to disappear. My skeleton of the page is going to come, come back. And then the content comes back in. Uh, that's going to be pretty horrible for a user experience. It also clutters up your browser browser history. Every time you have a page reload, uh, if you click your back button to try to go um, and look at your history on your back button, uh, it's just going to be filled up with that one site. Uh, is uh, another kind of a downside. And also, without Ajax, how are you going to watch this video? You can't do streaming content without some form of Ajax or some solution that does the same thing. Whether you're watching this, again, on either Twitch or Google, you can open up your network tab, and you can see all the Ajax requests or whatever technology they're using. Um, uh, I know Twitch uses Ajax. I haven't checked. I don't recall what. I've checked, but I don't recall what YouTube uses. Um, but you can watch all the Ajax requests come in as more and more of this video loads. Those are Ajax requests, the server saying, oh yeah, I got some more uh, more content for you. Here it is. I'm trying to remember what Google uses, but uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Is it possible to learn this power? I mean, you can go work for Google. Would probably be the way to experience that power. Uh, so... When, we, when we're sending Ajax requests, the data that we want to send, we have a lot of options here. Just like we did before, we had the options for what encoding type to use. But we have a few more options. I'll try to get out of the way here. Uh, we have a few more options when it comes to forms. It just says the closing tag of form. Um, we have a few more options here of how to send the Ajax request. Now, we can use forms just like we have been using. Set up the form mostly the same way except we don't need the method because Ajax is going to specify the method. We don't need the path because Ajax is going to specify the path. But we do want the encoding type for this specific way that I'm going to show you. If we have the encoding type, this form is still going to encode this data using that encoding type. But we're going to use JavaScript to be able to send that request to the server through an Ajax request instead of using the default HTML form behavior of however your browser handles HTML form submissions. It's not going to run through that code. It's going to run our custom JavaScript. So it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you prepare and send that data. Uh, so for this, I'm going to call a method send message with form. This is a JavaScript method that I've written. This isn't a built-in method. This is something um, This is something that you would write. You would have your JavaScript code. You would tie into the submit event so on a submit event you're going to call this javascript code and you have to end this with a return false which will block the page reload 
if you have this return false on the on submit, it's going to cut off the rest of the default action and not send the request using the default method of submitting a form. So return false is going to cut that off and not send the form the normal way, which would trigger a page reload. So now send message with form, whatever this method does, we're going to send the AJAX request and not get the page re reload, the default behavior of a page reload when this form is submitted. So what does send message with form do? It's gonna make our page, our AJAX request. We're gonna remove that on ready state change just to remove clutter from the slide. Uh, but in, in this method, we can get all of the form data using the form form data um, class so we're going to get the HTML element of our form we're going to create a new form data object using that form which this takes the entire HTML element of type form and it's going to give us all the data of the form using the encoding that we specified in the HTML element so for this HTML element we specified multi-part form data so form data here is going to be encoded using the multi-part form data encoding. And we just send that, just ship it. So you get the HTML element, create a form data object, and send that form data. Send that form data object. Your browser's going to handle all the rest. Everything else. This is part of why I don't have you do this on a homework, because the browser really does everything for you on the front end, and there's nothing interesting on the back end. On the back end, you're just going to have a send message form path, which is identical to what you're doing in homework three. You have to parse, in this example, you have to parse multi-part form data. This can have a file in it. This can have whatever. It's going to be the same exact format as a non-AJAX request to your server. Your server actually won't know. I mean, you're going to know as the developer how the paths are going to be used, but you don't code a path on your server any different just because it's an AJAX request or a page load, or serving static content, your server doesn't give a damn. Your server doesn't care that this is an AJAX request. It's just an HTTP request to the server. So there's nothing special on the server. You notice I haven't shown any server code. It's because the server doesn't care. It's just a post request to the send message form path. And this happens to be multi-part form, uh, form data encoded. Everything else is identical. Because who cares? Why would the server care if this was triggering a refresh on the browser, a page reload, or not? Server doesn't care. Just doesn't care. Um, which is why I gloss over the uh, the polling. That's why I just uh, confine it to this lecture. Because uh, we don't care server side. And the browser does everything for you client side. There's really not much uh, juicy content to talk about. Uh, but I do want to introduce it because we might use it later on in the course. We'll have some... Uh, when I want to use AJAX requests and examples, I want to be able to say, remember the AJAX lecture? We're going to use AJAX here. Plus, it's another acronym you can put on your resume. AJAX is a, a really nice one for your resume because you have to learn almost nothing. If you know JavaScript and front-end development at all, you can just slap AJAX on there. It's just an asynchronous JavaScript call that creates an HT, HTTP request. Uh, so another option, so that's using what we've seen already using a form and taking the existing structure that we've already learned about and using that for an AJAX request. Uh, that's how we can adapt HTML forms. We can also just skip the forms entirely uh, and not use any of the default HTML uh, behavior, the, brow the browser implementation of HTML, how browsers handle HTML. We can just bypass all of that and write our J uh, write our AJAX request manually. So here is effectively a form without the form element. And I just have a button instead of using an input. Now when that when I click this button, I have an on click. I'm going to react to the click event, call send message. And then send message is a method that I'll write, which is going to read the data in this input and send it to the user. So if you want to be more hands-on, you want to tear apart the HTML forms, get away from what those do for you, and really build things on your own, which I, in my opinion, you know, I, I like doing it this way. 
uh, personally, uh, the form, you know, sometimes the default behavior isn't what you want and you spend more time adding things like this return false to get rid of the default behavior because you don't want that behavior uh, than you do actually uh, uh, sending your requests and using those forms. So we create a button and then the send message, we want to pull this chat input, pull the information from that. So in that send message method, which gets called whenever someone clicks that button, we're going to get that input, get the uh, HTML element for that chat input, read its value, create our AJAX request, have that AJAX request post to the send message path, and then take that message, take that content, and put it in whatever format our servers, we're going to code our server to expect. So here I have my server expecting a JSON object with a key message and the, a value equal to the message that the user typed into the chat box. That's going to be my JSON string, and then I'll stringify that and ship that in the AJAX request. So it's all about options. You can use the forms and use the form data, or you can peel that away and get more hands-on and do more manual uh, manual creating your manually create your Ajax requests. If you want to use JSON, you got to do these manually. There's no uh, there's no encoding type for JSON for a form, unfortunately. I, I feel like there should be, but there's not. Um, so if you want to send them uh, send JSON, this is a way to do it. Read your elements manually, create your own JSON string and send that over the TCP socket as an HTTP request. Any questions on this, on, on Ajax? And at this point, I, I realize a lot of you probably have seen Ajax before. You've probably been exposed to this. But any, any more advanced questions, like at the level we're talking about now? If you were to use Ajax for the homework, can you use a pre-built serializer, deserializer? Uh, I mean, the serializer on the browser, I wouldn't have a problem with, but a deserializer on the... I mean, I'm just going to say no in the end. But a deserializer on the server, uh, no, that's, that's doing too much for you. I want you to all have hands-on experience with the multi-part form data um, format. So that's not really going to work for you. Oh, for JSON. I mean, where are you going to use that, though? JSON has to be sent in strings. You're not going to send a file with JSON. If you want to do that for Objective 1, knock yourself out. But for Objective 3, you can't use JSON. JSON's inherently strings, unless you're getting into Base64 encoding. If you go into Base64 encoding and you want to send JSON strings for your images, absolutely, good. go for it. Uh, you'll learn more doing that anyway. Uh, I think that's going to be harder than the way I have the homework set up. So if you want to do that, knock yourself out. And yeah, JSON, um, JSON parsers and and uh, yeah, you can use the JSON stuff if you want to go that route. Anyone, anyone listen to that though? That's probably going to be more difficult than than what I have expected. What I've expected you to do, uh, but maybe not. It does make one part of it easier. I don't know. It's up to you. Uh, Who's this Jason you keep mentioning? He's a cool guy. JSON is a, is a really nice format. We've we've gone years of different ways of representing data over the years, and before JSON, it was a pretty it was a pretty depressing area. Um, it was a pretty depressing problem. Uh, JSON came along and just simplified things incredibly. And if you don't believe that, if you don't appreciate JSON at all, try doing the same things we do in JSON. Whenever a class says, okay, we're going to use JSON here, try using one of the other formats. Try using any other format and see how it works for you. Not to say that there aren't other good alternatives, like YAML is pretty good. XML exists. Um, you can use a different format, but I don't know. For my, for me, JSON just it really does it for me. And... 
Uh, there's a reason. I think a lot of people agree with that because there's a reason why JSON has really taken over. Um, has really taken over the internet. JSON is our format of choice. All right, so let's talk about rendering content. We have a new. Uh, we have a new. Uh, oops. We have a new uh, question that this brings up. A new design decision. Again, for your homeworks, you don't really get to make this design decision. We're rendering everything server side. But we do have a new question that we can ask is where do we render content? So far, we've been rendering our HTML templates on the server side. So the server takes the HTML template, the structure of the page, takes the data of the page, combines them, generates the final HTML, and then sends that to the user. That's how we've been, uh, that's how we've been rendering our content in this class. That's probably how we'll do it the entire semester, uh, to be honest. If you want to get creative with the other homeworks, you know, I'll, I'll be fine with that. Um, but that, this is how I'm going to show you how to render the content with HTML templates. We're going to render it client, uh, server side and then send the final HTML. Uh, this is using up our CPU on the server to be able to render that content. Uh, but this isn't this isn't the only way and probably not the best way. I mean, there are pros and cons to the, the next approach that we'll talk about. Um, but this is pretty restrictive. So, for example, if you want to add a mobile app to your web app that doesn't support HTML. You want to build a mobile native app. How are you going to do that? Now, there are ways to do that these days. We can, uh, there are ways to take HTML, your HTML front end, and convert it into a web app. There are some nice solutions to that, but it's not super straightforward, and you do have to rely on that, uh, that solution existing to be able to convert your front end your web front end into a mobile app and you know i hear lots of stories of performance issues if you build a mobile native app it's going to be much more performant than if you run your web front end through a converter to convert it to a mobile app but there are solutions there are options there as well if you're not con or hyperly concerned about performance that's a good option anyway uh, there is an alternative to this is to just serve raw data just send json strings for example from your server Host JSON strings, have the client request those JSON strings through Ajax. So they'll request the structure of the HTML, that'll still be the same. But any data that you want to serve that's uh, that's specific to a user especially, you'll have that requested through Ajax requests. Just send the JSON strings, have the client parse the JSON strings, and render the HTML on the page. So now, instead of rendering the HTML client uh, server side, you're sending the HTML templates effectively to the client, and then the client can request data from your server. You just send the data, and then the client combines the HTML template, the structure of the page, with the data, renders that, and then displays it to the user, all client side. And this is using the client CPU for what it's worth. Um, but it is going to increase load times, presumably. I mean, maybe the client has more uh, more CPU, more RAM, more resources than what you're going to give each individual user on your server. You know, maybe it'll even decrease load times, to be honest. But it's probably going to increase load times for most of your users. They're not going to have the same kind of power that your server is going to have for a major app, but a corporation with tons of money, big server farms. Uh, so you're going to increase load times. But you are going to decrease the network, uh, the network, uh, the bandwidth usage. You're not going to use as much bandwidth because you're only sending the data, not the final HTML. There are a lot of pros and cons to this one. Um, and your backend now is only serving data through effectively an API. And this is a very common design, uh, design setup, design architecture for a web app is to have your server just be an API. So your server has all kinds of endpoints that are going to accept data and send data, but only data, and not really be concerned about the HTML. 
and then have one endpoint, which is going to be the front end HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, your, your uh, front end. So your web browser is going to request the front end, get the front end, but that has no functionality at all. And then to get the functionality, you access the API. Now, when you want to write that mobile app, you can write a native, a mobile native app, write a new front end in that mobile app language, which doesn't do anything, has no functionality. It's just the look and feel of your app. I shouldn't say just the look and feel. That's not to say that's not incredibly important. But the functionality of that app is going to access the same API endpoints as the web app. So you're just hosting an API. And then no matter what client you have, that client is just going to use your API in the same way as any other client. It's going to hit the same endpoints. Okay, I need to send a chat message. I hit this API endpoint, which is when I say endpoint, I mean a path. I'm going to hit this path with a post request. I'm going to hit this endpoint to get the chat history, a get request to chat history, uh, etc. And you can see this. This is why organizations like Netflix have an app for seemingly every single system you can think of. You can download Netflix onto it. So they're building a different front end for each, uh, for each, um, man, I'm blanking on my, my words here, uh, for each platform. Uh, they have a new front end for each platform, but each front end is accessing the same API. So their server, they didn't write a new server for their Xbox app. They didn't write a new server for their Android app. They didn't write a new server for their, uh, for their web app. It's all the same server which is hosting the actual content through API. So the core of what Netflix is, is just one server with an API, with an API exposed to the outside world. Not just one server, obviously it's you know geolocated, it's all over the world uh, and replicated everywhere, but there's one core server software, I'll say, that uh, that they use. And then for each, app that they build, they're just building a new front end that accesses that API. So no matter what platform you're on, you're watching Netflix through, you're still connecting to the same server. And that's how they can quickly develop a new, you know, they want to make a new app for iWatch or whatever the new platform they want to target is. They just send a team to write a front end, which duplicates the front ends that exist, duplicate that look and feel as much as they can. Uh, that's why you have slightly different look and feel in and uh, uh, very uh, slightly different look and feel across those apps, across those platforms. But they replicate it as best they can and then access the same API endpoints to get just the data from the server. And then once they get the data, they have whatever native media player they can have in that uh, for that device and then play that um, play that video on that device but the server is that api it's set up to be just that api hopefully that made sense i feel like i i talked about that for a while uh let's talk about polling maybe we won't get to that demo today let me try let me rip through polling pretty quick and get to that demo so there there is still a problem with this we can make the ajax request but what triggers an ajax request how do we get it, an ajax request to fire off what event are we listening for in the world of JavaScript uh, where everything's event-based? What event are we listening for that's going to send off that AJAX request? So polling is going to give us one answer for this. With polling, we just say, screw waiting for events. We're just going to fire off an AJAX request at regular intervals. So this is an, an example of polling. This set interval function in JavaScript is going to take a function they might get messages here, which tell ask the server for all the chat history, and a number of milliseconds for the, the interval. So what this is saying is every 1,000 milliseconds or one second, call the get messages method. The get messages method is going to make the AJAX request. That's the method that we saw earlier. It's going to create my AJAX request in get. Actually, I don't think we saw get messages. It's going to send off the AJAX request get the data and then render that for the user to see. It's gonna get just the data and then in JavaScript, we're gonna write the HTML to be able to get the user to see, uh, see that content. 
So this is super easy. This is one line of code. We're assuming we already have the get messages functionality. It's one line of code. You just slap this on here. You got polling. And now the user doesn't have to do anything to refresh the data or fire a, an AJAX request. An AJAX request is just sent every second. So cool, done, problem solved. The user doesn't have to take any action to see the new messages. And we do have a, an interactive site. Users can just go there and see new content that other users are posting. So let's have limitations. Uh, a user in this example might be waiting up to one se full second to be able to see somebody's new message. And there can be a lot of server load. If every second, say you have 100 users, that's 100 requests per second that are being sent even when there's no messages to be read. So this can add a lot of extra traffic. and uh, take up a lot of bandwidth. So we introduced long polling, where instead of responding to the polling request immediately, the server's going to intentionally wait. If the server has data to send, then it's going to respond immediately and say, okay, here's your new data, here's the new chat history, these people sent messages, here you go. If there's no data to send, if nobody sent a message and chat's pretty quiet, the long pull request comes in, the server waits and doesn't respond. So all of your code in your server says, okay, I got a request, let's send the response immediately, as fast as you can process it. With long polling, we're saying, okay, I got a request, but I don't have any new data to send to this user because I already sent them all of the chat history that I have. Let me just wait. Let me do nothing. And then another user sends something to the chat as soon as they get that new chat message, now there is something to send, then they're going to go to that long polling request that they've just been hanging on and respond to it with that new message. So the server is only going to respond when there's something, some new data to respond with. These will time out after a while. Usually you have like a 10 to 20 second timeout. If the server gets a long polling request in 10 to 20 seconds roughly, it uh, passes. The server's going to respond and say, hey, I got n nothing new for you. And then the client's going to get that response and then open up another long pull request. So the goal is to always have every client have a long pull request open that the server's just sitting on waiting for data to come in. You got 10 clients all with long pulling requests open, just waiting. And then an 11th client or one of those 10 sends a message to the chat. You respond to all 10 of them and say, hey, there's new data. So the user gets their information in the new chat history immediately. As soon as data comes in, just respond to that long polling request. Uh, they get that interactive um, uh, interaction immediately, and then create new po long polling requests and just wait. Uh, and the problem here that we're solving is that HTTP is a request response protocol. So how do we send data to the user without them asking for it? Well, the answer is to have them ask for it and then just wait and leave them hanging until we have something to send them. That's what long polling does for us. Uh, we'll get the same. We won't actually do long polling in this class. Uh, I want you to be aware of what it is. Um, but we're going to get the same functionality with WebSockets, which is the next homework, homework four, which is a more modern solution to this. But you will see long polling out there in the wild. There's some major sites that still use long polling. So it is something you need to be aware of. It's something that you might encounter in your careers. You might work for a company that uses this. For example, Facebook Messenger. Last I checked anyway, and it seems like it's not, not updating, not going to change. Uh, they're still using long polling for that. Uh, there was a, an engineer that said, hey, it works. Why change it? It was pretty much Facebook's statement. Uh, and one thing about long polling is it's going to be compatible with any browser. Any browser that supports HTTP, which is all of them, it's going to work. Uh, let's show this very quickly. I do want to get this in lecture. But here's... Uh, come on, give it to me. Here we go. Uh, so here's a, a server I'm running. Simple, uh, this is just cut and paste for the last lecture example. But I have a chat, and post to the chat. 
man, it isn't. I still have something going on. But I can see my polling going on. When I send a message, I send a message to the chat. And every one second, I'm going to send this get messages request, which is going to contain all the messages that have been sent to the chat. I would like to see this working. I have this working, I swear. I know I have my last bug. Well, I'm gonna just keep working on that after lecture, but let's end lecture there, I'm already three minutes over.